Welcome to the Starfleet Leadership Academy, a Star Trek podcast told through the lens of leadership development. And now, here's your host, Jeff Aiken. Welcome, everyone, and thank you, Pat, for the intro. Hey, I, I just wanted to thank all of you for listening to this podcast. It, it, really, it really means the world to me that you're, that you're checking it out. If you like what you hear, please share it with a friend. On this episode, we round out the first episodes or pilot episodes of the Star Trek series that we'll be reviewing as we join the original series as they go where no man has gone before. I'm going to do my best to not call out some of the things in this episode that don't necessarily line up with future Star Trek. They were they were still figuring things out and the concepts of continuity or canon didn't really exist at this time. What I do want to say right away, though, is that if you have not checked out the remastered version of this episode lately, do it now. No, seriously, go ahead. Pause the podcast. I'll wait. Okay, now that you've watched it, what a gorgeous episode. There was nothing on TV that looked this good in 1966. I dare you to show me otherwise. We start off with a captain's log. Captain's log. Stardate 1312.4. A recorded distressed call from an Earth ship lost over two centuries ago. Kirk and Spock are playing 3D chess. They start to teach us that Spock doesn't quote unquote have emotions and that he's partly human. Kirk, though, surprises Spock with an unexpected chess move. And here comes one of the most beautiful moves in chess history. Even this early in the series, they're building that relationship. It's really cool. In the transporter room, they bring aboard an old-style ship recorder. It activates on the pad, and Kirk calls for the alert as he and Spock head to the bridge. Put all decks on the alert. This early in the episode, and I know I know, I said I try not to do this, but man, there's some cool things. It's really neat to see the ideas for things that will come later. Like they've got the division logos on the Delta Shield. They're the right shapes, but not the right divisions yet. Like the, uh, the sweater tops, they use the different colors to show the divisions. They don't line up with what we know we'll see in the future. It's it's not quite there, but it's really close to what we'll see. I, I really enjoy dissecting all the various uniforms on Star Trek throughout all the series and the movies, so, so this is some pretty cool stuff. Kirk and Spock get to the bridge where we meet Lieutenant Commander Gary Mitchell. Spock begins analyzing the data from the ship recorder from the USS Valiant as they approach the edge of the galaxy. Kirk calls for all the department heads for a quick touch base. Uh, Department head, sir, you wanted everybody on the bridge before we left the galaxy. Here we meet Dr. Daner, a psychiatrist who uh, apparently had a change in career when she was promoted as Major Margaret Hollips Houlihan for a film that came out a few years after this episode. You might have heard of it. We also meet Dr. Piper, the chief medical officer, Mr. Scott with engineering, and Mr. Sulu with astro sciences. Real classy moves from uh, from Mitchell here. Hmm. Walking freezer unit. Spock explains the Valiant encountered an unknown force and that they started frantically researching ESP. Daner states that she tested fairly high on the uh, Esper tests before. That's extra sensory perception. The Valiant ordered the ship destroyed to protect it from whatever had been threatening it. Kirk immediately seeks input from the department heads before ordering the Enterprise towards the potential threat. Two points in this series of exchanges. First, Kirk not only listens intently to Spock, but actively seeks input from others. Asking the various department heads for their input shows he's interested in the bigger picture, not just the world as he knows it. This is the advantage of fostering a team for decision-making, specifically a very diverse team. People with different education, different specialties, different experiences will see things much differently than you. Their input is always valuable. It may not always be the actionable input, though, and that kind of leads us to the second thing here. Kirk, Kirk makes a decision. He doesn't crawl down rabbit holes looking to answer questions that aren't relevant. He doesn't analyze the situation to death, analysis paralysis as it's been called. He gets the relevant input, he makes a decision, and puts it into action. 
This second point is one I think many, many people and many leadership teams can benefit greatly from. They approach the threat in these graphics. These graphics are beautiful. It's confusing their sensors and all of their readings. Once they make contact with it, the bridge lights up and a terminal explodes. Then Daner and Mitchell go down. Kirk calls for a helmsman to take Mitchell's spot as he pulls another incredible leadership move. He jumps out of the captain's chair and takes over the helm controls. Spock sees this and immediately jumps in to take the controls so Kirk can get back to his station. Okay, a lot to get into here. Let me share an inadvertent leadership lesson I learned when I was 17 years old. Trust me, it totally relates to this scene. When I was in high school, I washed dishes at a buffet restaurant. For those of you listening to this in a post-COVID-19 world, a buffet was a magical place where various foods were served. You could walk around, pick out whatever you wanted and eat as much of it as you liked. At a buffet, you could pile your plate with fried chicken, pizza, nachos, cheesecake, coleslaw, whatever else. And then, and then you could go back for more. Oh, those were the days. Okay, back to the story. It was Thanksgiving. You can imagine how busy we were. The line nearly wrapped around our building. In the dish room, we had a fancy conveyor belt dishwasher and a pot sink. Scrubbing pots was the worst possible job in the entire restaurant. I mean, it was gross. So, of course, I'm the one washing pots. I'm just a riverboat dishwasher boy. I start getting backed up and it's starting to impact the kitchen. So our general manager, an incredible human being, uh, his name's Jason, uh, he walked back. He saw my nightmare. I remember his name was Jason. I will never forget this guy for this very lesson that I'm sharing with you now. I fully expect him to pull somebody off of another job to hopefully, hopefully help me out. But he didn't. Instead, he took off his suit jacket, rolled up his sleeves, and he started scrubbing pots with me. Here's the big boss, the guy that calls all the shots doing the dirtiest job possible. Kirk does the same thing here, and like Jason, does it without hesitation. The understanding that every job is critical and that no one is too good for any job goes miles in fostering a positive and empowering culture. And then Spock's involvement. Spock is actively reviewing the records of the other ship um, that, that, that encountered the threat, their only other source of information. And he doesn't even pause before taking the controls from Kirk. He understands that the ship needs its captain. Specifically, it needs someone to coordinate all the varied efforts to keep the ship safe and to make the necessary decisions to do so. Emergency stations. All decks on fire alert. Neutralize controls. Kelso, put on Really, really good stuff here. And the fact it all happens in the space of about four seconds just hammers home the great leadership the Enterprise enjoys. As they get through the ordeal, Dr. Daner wakes up, slowly, carefully. Kirk helps Mitchell up, but his eyes are all messed up. They're, they're covered in silver. They actually had the actors wear the early, early style contact lenses. I think they were called uh, scler scleral lenses. They're called scleral lenses. And they put foil, like a uh, foil between the layers of the lens to give it that look. Ugh, ouch. So he makes his way to sick bay. Spock reviews the personnel records of Mitchell and Daner. He has questions about why they were affected the way they were. Um, no one else was. He finds that they both have very high scores on their Starfleet ESP tests. Star Trek is now, and always has been, committed to demonstrating diversity in action. There's no mention of this in show, it's just business as usual, as communication officer Alden is working to repair damaged bridge terminals. Sounds pretty routine, right? Well, Alden is played by Lloyd Haynes, who went on to be a regular on the series Room 222. Oh yeah, and he's a black man. In 1966, a black man on a television show just working alongside his co-workers? No mention of race, just a dude doing his job. Super cool. The ante is, of course, up when Uhura ultimately takes his place, and now we have a woman of color doing the same thing. Star Trek continued and continues to demonstrate diversity as we, as a society, understand more about people and what makes them so amazing. Kirk visits Mitchell in sickbay. 
some fun back and forth with them establishing their friendship and that Mitchell, Mitchell, he's, he's feeling just fine. They apparently had a memorable time at Denim 4, which we mentioned in episode two of the Starfleet Leadership Academy when the Next Generation crew was, uh, was on Denim 4 during um, Encounter at Farpoint. Hmm. Mitchell's telepathy, or ESP, was really critical in their mission there. We learned that when Kirk was a lieutenant, he was an instructor at Starfleet Academy, and a pretty tough one, too. Mitchell tells a fun story about how he set Kirk up with a girl without Kirk knowing he was behind it. Kirk says he almost married the girl. Huh. Do a little math, right? Carry the one. I wonder if that could have been Carol Marcus. Hmm. How can you ask me that? Were we together? Were we going to be? You had your world, and I had mine. Anyway, he's been reading to pass the time, even reading some of that, quote, long-haired stuff. When the truth is found. Isn't everything ultimately just a product of its time? The playful banter takes a turn as Kirk goes to leave. Mitchell's voice is suddenly powerful, and he warns, Didn't I say you'd better be good to me? After Kirk leaves, we see a short sequence of Mitchell reading at an absolutely inhuman speed. Spock is watching him on a video screen on the bridge as Kirk orders a 24-hour watch on sickbay and orders every possible range of examinations and tests. As he makes this order, Mitchell stares intently straight into the camera as if staring directly at Kirk. Dr. Piper is running the ordered tests on Mitchell and says he looks to be perfect, like absolutely perfect. He leaves, leaving Mitchell with Daner. Daner makes a powerful statement about being a woman professional in response to Mitchell calling her a walking freezer unit. Hmm. As they talk, Mitchell realizes he can make the medical readout say whatever he wants him to. He spikes them all the way and then follows that with a flat line. Maybe if I could just change these dials. All at will. He's just discovering his powers, but he also realizes that they're in their infancy. Daner tests his memory, and he recites a page given to him at random from one of the books he devoured earlier. He reminds her that she was also affected, uh, but she claims that she feels no ill effects or any, any benefits whatsoever. Kelso, the ship's navigator, drops in to see how Mitchell is doing. Mitchell just jumps down his throat as he's asking about the ship's repairs. I'm not joking, Lee. He's totally convinced that Kelso missed a critical detail on the impulse engine packs, one that if truly missed could disable or destroy the whole ship. Kelso checks it out and reports to the senior officers that Mitchell was correct. There's no way Mitchell could have known that this was wrong, but he did know. Spock seems to have been waiting for this opportunity. He posits that Mitchell is mutating and is an extreme danger. Daner begins to argue, but Kirk cuts her off. It is my duty, whether pleasant or unpleasant, to listen to the reports, observations, even speculations on any subject that might affect the safety of this vessel. I'm going to say that again. It's a very powerful statement he makes. He states that it is his job to listen to the details, good or bad, for the good of the ship. The officers share examples of odd occurrences around the ship, all attributed to Mitchell. Kirk calls Daner out for not reporting this earlier. An unexpected response from her, though, as she defends her and Mitchell's actions. She states that, A mutated superior man could also be a wonderful thing. The the forerunner of a, a new and better kind of human being. Kirk pauses to consider this and continues asking the senior officers for their input. More of what we saw earlier in the episode. Kirk knows he has to make a huge decision. To make things even more complicated, he has to make a huge decision that will impact his ship and his crew, but will also personally affect his longtime friend, Gary Mitchell. He concludes the meeting by stating there will be no discussion of this with the crew. Some may question that decision. As leaders, we're often told, and rightly so, that transparency is important, critical even. I believe, and Kirk demonstrates here, that he also believes there's a difference between transparency and sausage making. This company uses the hind leg meat left over from the hams they sell. You've heard the saying, laws like sausages cease to inspire respect and proportion as we know how they're made. Basically, the details of how a thing came to be are not always relevant or even helpful upon sharing. In sausage making, there are a lot of things sent through the grinder and often even more things that are not sent through. Imagine this. 
you're making some sausage. You toss meat, spices, you know, stuff like that into the grinder. You encase it. It's good to go. Yeah, delicious. But what no one knows is that you considered putting some leftover rotten beef in there. A cold pizza and part of a Snickers bar. They were lying around and you thought about it. In fact, you even went so far as to start opening the Snickers bar. But then you never put them through the grinder. Those things never went into the sausage. Is there any reason, is there any value in sharing that you considered those things? Absolutely not. All you'll do is gross people out and honestly make them less likely to eat any sausage you ever make and likely cause them to lose respect for you as a cook. In this case, when Kirk gives the order to not discuss this, he's acknowledging that nothing they've discussed has been finalized, nor does it need to be shared at this point. They have basically looked at all the ingredients for the sausage, ruled out the rotten beef, and might still be considering the Snickers bar. They'll share the details when the time is right and when they know which details need to be shared. In this case, the details escalate quickly as Spock pleads his case that Mitchell needs to be killed. Kill Mitchell while you still can. He suggests a nearby planet that can be used to recharge the engines and that Mitchell could possibly be stranded there. It's an unmanned outpost. Spock here plays a solid advisor. Oftentimes a leader, they need to hear someone say the thing they don't want to hear, but that they very likely know. Kirk decides to send the Enterprise to Delta Vega as per Spock's recommendation. Oh, Vincent Vega, our man in Amsterdam. He puts together a crew led by Kelso to gather supplies and to recharge the engines. Spock, Daner, and Kirk plan on taking Mitchell down to the planet to maroon him. They head into sickbay to get him where we see he's now developed telekinesis. Kirk, in a master move, asks Mitchell what he would do if their roles were reversed. Mitchell agrees with Spock. Probably just what Mr. Spock is thinking now. Kill me. Well, you can. As if to put the final point on it, Mitchell shocks Kirk using his mind. He then talks about his plans to use a planet. Says he could become godlike. As he carries on, Kirk attacks him. <laughs> Daner injects him with something that knocks him out, and they beam down to the planet along with Dr. Piper. Mitchell begins to wake up as they carry him off. Daner and Kirk look across the barren wasteland, which leads to one of Kirk's best lines ever. Nobody but us chickens, Doctor. Kirk and Kelso talk about the possibility of using fuel cells in the outpost as a bomb to blow the whole place up remotely, if needed. As they discuss this, Spock comes to get Kirk as Mitchell is waking up in his cell. Mitchell appeals to Kirk with memories that the two of them shared from missions in the past. Situation escalates pretty quickly and Mitchell tries to escape the cell. The shock of the force field brings his eyes back to normal for just a second. He tells them, though, that he just keeps getting stronger. Back in the outpost, Spock continues to encourage Kirk to kill Mitchell. He, he even has a phaser rifle beam down. Kirk, trusting his crew and their input, asks Spock why he disagrees with a trained psychiatrist. Spock recites the mathematics of it. A fly who can travel at uh, 20 miles an hour and leaves a tire of bicycle being and flies to the tire of bicycle aid and backwards and forwards and so on and so forth until the two bikes collide and the poor little fly is squashed. <laughs> and that with his powers continuing to grow, Mitchell will be an unstoppable force before they can do anything about it. Kelso reports that he's set the bomb up successfully, though Kirk tells him that if Mitchell escapes and Kelso feels it's necessary, detonate the bomb. With the engines nearly regenerated, the away teams begin returning to the ship. Daner states that she's decided that she'll be staying behind with Mitchell, his hair's beginning to gray at the temples. While discussing him, Mitchell uses his powers to strangle Kelso in the other end of the outpost with the wires that are hanging around. Mitchell, with his booming voice, tells Kirk, You should have killed me while you could, James. He then shocks Kirk and Spock to incapacitate them, drops the force field, and reveals to Dr. Daner that her eyes are now silvered over as well. Sometime later, Dr. Piper catches up with Kirk and Spock to revive them. Kirk immediately heads off in the direction Mitchell and Daner left the outpost in. Before he goes, though, he gives a time limit to the doctor, letting him know that if he's not in contact by then, to head to the nearest Earth base and recommend bombardment of the planet's surface. Dr. Piper begins to protest, but Kirk cuts him off. No protest on this, Mark. That's an order. 
it is a reality that sometimes as a, as a leader, you just have to tell people what to do. I see this as an absolute last resort, a, a life or death sort of situation, which Kirk believes this to be. When you find yourself in a position of just having to tell people what to do, it either means the situation is so critical, so dire, there simply isn't time for debate, and you'd better be ready to accept the consequences, or everything has fallen apart, and people simply aren't following your lead. In that case, you have a lot more work in front of you as you need to repair your leadership position. Mitchell and Daner are wandering the wastes. Mitchell demonstrates his power as he creates an oasis out of nothing. He then begins preaching to Daner about their godhood and how, once her powers have grown, they can do anything. Kirk isn't far behind, and he's armed with that phaser rifle. Good thinking, Mr. Spock. Mitchell feels his presence and sends Daner after him as she begins to be able to see him in her mind as well. He says he wants her to see just how unimportant they are. Kirk appeals to Daner to help him, tries to convince her that Mitchell is dangerous. Daner still sees herself and Mitchell as evolved human beings. She warns Kirk, Please go back while you still can. But Kirk debates her. He says that it's our frailties that make us great. He addresses her as a psychiatrist. He leans on her professionalism. This gives her pause enough that Kirk sees Mitchell approaching. He fires the phaser rifle at him, and it doesn't affect him at all. Pretty iconic moment as Mitchell threatens Kirk's death. He conjures up a fully dug up burial plot and a headstone that reads, James R. Kirk. Now, if you've watched much Star Trek, you know his name is James Tiberius Kirk. There are a few theories as to why the headstone reads R. The truth being simply at the time they wrote this and made the props, somebody probably just picked a letter. But there's some pretty good theories out there and a few explanations in non-canon novels. My favorite is from Michael Jan Friedman's series where it's explained as an inside joke between Kirk and Mitchell that Mitchell didn't actually ever know Kirk's middle name. Daner steps in. She starts pleading with Mitchell to stop, but he continues the attacks. Kirk sees an opportunity and starts to drive the wedge between the two of them. He convinces Daner that it's a matter of time until Mitchell turns on her too. She hears him. She starts fighting back. They start trading psychic shocks back and forth. As he weakens, Gary's eyes turn back to normal and Kirk goes on the offensive. Now this is the Star Trek fighting we all know and love. A few seconds in, Kirk's shirt is ripped. He grabs a rock to smash Gary's head, but he, but he pauses, and he gives just enough time for the silver to come back into his eyes. And now, with superhuman strength, Mitchell lifts a boulder to hurl at Kirk. But Kirk judos his way through the throw, sending them both barreling into the burial plot. Kirk leaps out, grabs the phaser rifle, and causes an avalanche of rocks and debris to fall on top of Mitchell, crushing and burying him. Checks in on Dr. Daner, who's weakened from the battle with Mitchell. She collapses and dies as Kirk calls the Enterprise for a beam out. The episode ends with bandaged Kirk on the bridge. He's listing Daner and Mitchell as killed in the line of duty. I want a service record to end that way. He didn't ask for what happened to him. He acknowledges they didn't ask for what happened to them. It takes courage. It takes really strong leadership to recognize what is and isn't the choice of a person or what is or isn't under their control. A person should only ever be held accountable for that which they can control. In what will become a staple in the ending of original series episodes, Spock comes to Kirk's chair to reflect on what's happened. He shares that he too felt for Mitchell and Dr. Daner. So Kirk, of course, responds that, I believe there's some hope for you after all, Mr. Spock. Oh, what a great episode. I I was a little apprehensive heading into this one. I remembered it as kind of corny and slow. The reality is that much of this episode would fare well on modern TV. It had some shortcomings, but they were mostly products of their time. The fascination with ESP, it's a thing we don't really discuss anymore, at least not in these terms. Uh, The general characterization of women, which is going to sadly be kind of a normal thing in the original series. Kudos to them for generally making Elizabeth Daner a strong, independent professional. But even with her, there were some pretty rough moments, specifically between her and Mitchell. Some of Kirk and Mitchell's back and forth was 
pretty low brow, uh, I hate to use the term, but you know, locker room style talk. But other than that, this was a really well told story of two friends being violently torn apart by circumstances outside their control. It introduces some solid sci-fi elements. It really set the stage for the Star Trek universe we know today. The characters were well developed. I even felt the sting of loss when Kelso was murdered. All the characters that last into the run of TOS evolve and change through the series, but they don't deviate too much from what we see here. Sulu's assignment to Astro Sciences is even pretty backed up in future episodes when we learn of his uh, his hobby for, for uh, practicing botany and his ability to act as either a navigator or a helmsman. TOS was my first Star Trek. I grew up watching reruns and syndication with my mom. In fact, one of my most cherished things to do with my mom was, was watch Star Trek. This episode is a great kickoff and preview of what is to come with this legendary series. I mean, had I been one of the millions of people that tuned in on the 22nd of September 1966 to see this, I'd have been hooked. And yes, I know this was the third episode to air of the original series, but for the Starfleet Leadership Academy, I wanted to start with the pilot or the first episode of each series. Command codes verified. Kirk and Spock. Doesn't get a lot bigger than this duo. One of the top-selling pieces of merchandise for every presidential election is promoting the Kirk-Spock ticket. When most of us think of these two, we think of the fully developed pair we see in the Star Trek movies, or, or we really think about the entirety of their relationship. I tend to think of the heartbreaking end to the Wrath of Khan. I have been and always shall be yours. But if that ideation of them is the gourmet meal we all remember so fondly, in this episode, we get the home-cooked version that was made by your teenagers. That's to say, all the ingredients were there, they just aren't quite the same. And that's okay, really. Like, it's a good thing. That means these characters grow as people, and for our purposes, as leaders. Spock plays an important part in this episode, but doesn't do a lot to flex his leadership muscles. What he did do, and we talked about it during the episode, was offer alternatives to Kirk, specifically the alternatives that Kirk wouldn't have wanted to hear or acknowledge. When you're directly supporting someone, this is one of the things they desperately need. When we have ideas, it's very tempting to put blinders on and just dive straight towards your end goal. Chances are, though, there are things you haven't even considered yet. Maybe things you would never have even thought of given your experience and your understanding. Or maybe just things you didn't give enough attention to. Having a team around you, especially one you can trust, can counter that. On one hand, they may offer considerations that still lead you to follow your original course of action, but now you're doing so having considered more aspects of it. Or their input and questions could cause you to change course. Either way, you'll have a more complete view and understanding of your final decision. Now, Kirk, I'm looking forward to every opportunity to reflect on Kirk's leadership style. In the past 20 or 30 years, the zeitgeist has painted a picture of James Kirk that just doesn't hold up to any level of scrutiny. She packed my bags last night, pre-flight. What we see in Kirk and where no man has gone before is very much an ideal leader, especially for what was known in the paradigm of the mid-60s. From this episode, I want to highlight two things with him. The first is one we covered in detail earlier. When Gary Mitchell went down, he did not miss a beat in stepping up to fill his station. His operationalized understanding that no one person is more important than anyone else is simply inspiring an added bonus that he actually knew how to do the job, or, or maybe that's why Spock was so quick to take his place. Second, it is clear in this episode, through both his words and his actions, that his number one priority is the safety of the Enterprise and the crew as a whole. In this episode, his close friend and former student, Gary Mitchell, becomes a supreme threat to the Enterprise and arguably the entire galaxy. Despite his personal feelings, his every decision is guided by ensuring the ship's safety. In fact, he even orders Dr. Piper to leave the planet with him on it if he is unable to neutralize Mitchell and Daner. This makes for good, high-drama television, but how does it translate to you and your leadership journey? Well, very uncomfortably, to be honest. Let me paint a scenario for you that might be a lot more commonplace than we like to think. You have a coworker, let's say they're a peer, 
You've worked together for quite a while, and, and, and you consider them to be a friend, a, a work friend at least. You're visiting with each other at the end of the day, and you ask them about the job they were holding interviews for. They tell you about this great candidate, but then they mention they would never be able to hire them because of their race and because of their religion. They just need too many days off or whatever. Then they make a few inappropriate jokes and change the subject. This peer of yours, this friend, has just put your company in jeopardy and has demonstrated they're not fit for their role. So what do you do? Well, Jim Kirk would deal with this person, likely hire the best candidate, and be sure his friend was never put in a position to cause harm like that again. That's what it looks like when you put the mission ahead of yourself. On top of that and everything else, he's consistently seeking input from others, and with that input, he makes actionable decisions. So, what are your thoughts? What lessons did you learn? What did I miss? You can catch me across social media at Jeff T. Aiken. That's Jeff T. as in Thomas, A-K-I-N. Reach out. Use the hashtag SFLA for Starfleet Leadership Academy to keep the discussion going. And hey, if you like what you've heard on the podcast, tell a friend. A little housekeeping on how we proceed from here. At the time of this recording, there are five completed live-action Star Trek series. Original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. On top of that, we have Discovery and Picard. Section 31, Lower Decks, and Strange New Worlds have all been announced, but nothing has been produced yet. My intention is to include all of the episodes from the completed five, plus Discovery but I ultimately want to give you what you want to hear. So if you want me to include Picard or the animated series, let me know. You can hit me up again on social media at Jeff T. Aiken. So how do we go from here? Please specify how you would like to proceed, sir. I put all the episodes from the six series I'm including at this point into a spreadsheet. At the end of each episode, I'll run a random selector macro to tell me which episode we'll be looking at next. So, let's see what we're watching. Working. And it's Strange New World from the first season of Enterprise. So we'll see you next time as we join Archer and his crew. And until then, ex astra scientia.